Welcome back to Minitorch. In module 1.3, we're going to dive into the details of backpropagation. Recall from last class, we defined a function f of x equals x times 5 in Python by inheriting from the scalar function static class. These classes will have two static methods. The first is forward, which computes the function itself, in this case computing x times 5. We can also define functions of multiple arguments, like x times 5, by returning x times 5, the floating point value. These will be defined as boxes that take two in arrows and return one out arrow. We'll only ever consider functions that return a single scalar value. In addition, we defined a backwards static method, whose job it was, was to compute the f prime of this original function at a given value x. In order to use the x value, we required that the forward function call save for backwards to save this information around for the backwards pass. In the backwards pass, we're passed two arguments, the context with the saved value, as well as a special value d. Our job is to compute f prime of x, in this case, 2 times x, and return that value times d. We draw this as a box with arrows going the opposite direction. The role of forward pass was to actually compute the function of interest, as well as to implicitly compute the computational graph that represents each of the scalar functions that were called in this process. These computational graphs can get quite complex. In the homework module, we included a special visualizer that allows you to write down an arbitrary complex mathematical function and shows you what the computational graph will look like. In this example here, we have two scalar variables, x and y, and then we have a very complex mathematical function. This function can contain loops and different mathematical operations. But the main point is that at the end of the day, we don't actually really care about the code itself as much as the actual traced computational graph that was computed along the way. In this lecture, we'll focus on the backwards part of this process. In particular, we'll talk about the chain rule of differentiation and how this can be implemented using an algorithm known as backpropagation. So let's first go through a reminder of what the chain rule tells us about how derivatives work. Before we define backpropagation, let's define the API that a user will utilize. Let's assume that these two boxes represented on this slide here represent a complex function which we'll call h. h takes an input argument x and returns a value. Let's say we want to compute the derivative of h with respect to its input. We can define this by applying uh, several boxes, like the ones in the code, and then calling dot backward. Once we've called dot backward on the final value, we'll be able to have access to the derivative x dot derivative. As you probably could have, could have guessed, we're going to do this by applying the chain rule. Let me define the chain rule using the notation we've used so far in this class. We're going to assume for now that we're computing the derivative of the composition of two functions. I'll write that as f prime sub x of g of x. This is equal by the chain rule to the derivative of g applied to x times the derivative of f applied to its input, which is g of x. We can write this in a slightly simplified form utilizing our box notation. So in particular, let's define the intermediate term as a value z equal to g of x. Let's then also define a value d equal to f prime applied to z. If we have these two values, we can compute the derivative of the composition as g prime times d. If we look at the boxes themselves, we can see that the d value, f prime applied to z, is equivalent to calling backwards on the second box with an input value of 1. The final value is equivalent to applying backwards on the first box with an input value of d. This tells us that we can move from right to left on these graphs simply by passing in the value needed by the chain rule in order to compute the composition of the derivative terms. Let's go through an example. Uh, let's assume that the function we're interested in is log of x squared. Here, we have a composition of two boxes. The first g of x is equal to log of x, 
then the second, which we'll call f of z, is equal to z squared. We're composing these two boxes together to get the full function of interest. Once we have this, we can compute the derivative of both of these boxes. f prime of z is equal to 2z times 1, and g prime is equal to 1 over x. These correspond to half of the backward method for each of the implied scalar functions. We can then utilize the back propagation rule to compute f prime x for g of x for any arbitrary input x. I'll leave this as an exercise for you to go through and compute this using both your standard understanding of the chain rule and also by thinking through how each of the backward functions work together. As a second example, we can consider x squared squared. This can be broken into two elementary functions. One is g of x equals x squared, and one is f of z equals z squared. We can compute both of their derivatives using just standard symbolic differentiation. This gives us f prime of z equals 2 times z, and g prime of x equals 2 times x. Here, we can then write down the main rule, which corresponds to f prime with respect to x is equal to 2 times x times 2 times x squared. This leads to a final symbolic form of 4x to the third. I'll again leave it to the listener to go through and check that the backward version would compute the same value for uh, this using the functions we've seen in the previous slides. There are several other cases that we need to think through to ensure that backpropagation corresponds to the correct application of the chain rule. I'll go through these two cases relatively informally just to give you some intuition about how this works. So the first case we'll do is a two-argument chain rule. So here we'll assume that g takes x and y as input arguments but we're interested in the function f that takes g's output as a single input argument. We can write down the chain rule for both of these terms, f prime sub x and f prime sub y, as these two equations, g prime sub x for x comma y times f prime sub g x comma y of g x comma y. Now again, writing this in lightly simplified forms, we can see that these two terms correspond to the following two equations, g prime with respect to x times d, and g prime with respect to y times d. The main point I want to make here is that even though we have different equations for the two derivatives, they're both multiplied by the same d value. That d value comes from computing f prime of z. Computationally, this is very beneficial. It means we only need to compute the box on the right one time in order to compute this d value. That d value can then be passed back into the first box in order to get the two derivatives of interest. This is particularly nice if you assume that there are 100 boxes in a row and all of them simply take one argument. We can simply run through all those 100 boxes to compute d and only the final box needs to split into two parts. In particular, it's worth contrasting this with numerical differentiation, which required us to add and subtract epsilon from each one of our input arguments in order to approximate their derivatives. Here's an example you can play through for computing the chain rule with a two-argument function. Here, g of x comma y is equal x times y, and f of z is equal to z squared. We can write this as the derivatives on this slide, f prime of z is simply equal to 2z times 1, and g prime of x is equal to y, and g prime of y is equal to x. If we compute their combined values, we get symbolic forms of 2z times y and 2z times x. Again, the main point of interest here is the fact that the 2z term is shared and therefore the first box doesn't really need to know anything about the second box, but can simply take in its value. The other important case is when the second box takes in the first box two times. So here, we're assuming that f takes two arguments, and those arguments both come out of the first box as g of x. This is a little bit hard to draw in my notation, 
but is an important case to consider. You can show that the chain rule applied in this case corresponds to a D value that uses the first term two times. So we get a D value that's equal to one times the derivative with respect to the first argument of the second box, and then with respect to the second argument of the first box. The key point here though is because the output of the first box was used twice in the second box, we need to add together its derivatives in the chain rule. We'll see this case in more detail when we get to gradients and multivariate functions. But for now, the key point is that if a scalar variable gets used multiple times, we end up having to add together its usage in the backward pass. So for this to work, we have to compute the f function and then separately add together the intermediate d values before passing them back to the first box. This will cause some complications in backpropagation that is important to note at this point in the process. So those are the main techniques that we're going to be using. Next up, let's talk about how to actually turn this into an algorithm to compute complex derivatives. So recall that we have access to a complex computational graph. We got this by defining scalars and then tracking them through mathematical notation to get the graph structure itself. We'd like to then use graph and uh, basically apply the chain rule at each node in order to get the full derivative for the term of interest. We're going to do this in particular by making sure that we only call backwards once per variable in this graph and that each one of these calls is correct using the definitions we've previously defined. In order to go through this process, we're going to use an example function shown here. We'll define z equal to x times y. That's the first node on the left. Then we'll define our full h as log z plus x z. You can think of log z as the top node in the middle, x z as the uh, bottom node in the middle, and their addition as the node on the right. That was the forward pass, but now we're interested in the backwards pass. Recall that the definitions of the chain rule allow us to step one step backwards in time. We do this by passing a d variable to the backward method, which then gives us d variables which can be passed backwards in time. To say that another way, if we have a derivative with respect to a scalar, we can utilize the chain rule to trade that for a derivative with respect to the input of a function that was last called on that scalar. That is, move one step backwards in the computational graph. We do that by applying the chain rule through that function. So from a mathematical point of view, that's all we really need. But from a computational point of view, order really matters. We want to be very careful that we're only calling backwards on each function one time. Specifically, if there is a box in this graph, we should only pass through that box one time. To do this, we need to ensure that all of the derivatives for a variable are calculated before we ever call backward. The property we're interested in is that we don't process any variable until all the variables to the right of it have been processed first. We haven't really formally defined what right and left means. So first we're going to define that and then we'll utilize that property. So specifically what we're going to do is we're gonna run a topological sort on the graph. Um, I hope you've seen topological sorting in your algorithms class. If not, it's very well documented online or in Wikipedia. And you can see that it will give us a way of ordering nodes within a directed acyclic graph. Our graph is directed and acyclic because, well, we didn't allow any cycles, and every time we applied a scalar function, the graph simply got larger. From a high-level perspective, we're going to run a depth-first search and mark the nodes in the graph. This will define a topological order, which ensures that we've completed each node before we move on to the next one in backwards order. I won't go through the algorithm in too much detail, it's relatively straightforward to implement. It should be about 10 lines of Python code. And here's the specific algorithm we'll implement in practice. What topological sort will do is it will start from the rightmost node and walk over each of the circle nodes in this graph. It'll assign an ordering that'll ensure that we can visit each node from right to left and complete each node before we move on to the next one. Once we have this topological order, 
we can implement back propagation as a graph propagation algorithm from right to left in the graph. We'll start from the rightmost side with the value 1, and then compute the d value for each of the individual variables as we go. Recall that specifically, if a variable is used multiple times, we'll need to sum up the d values at that variable before calling backwards on the next step. In particular, PyTorch uses the following terminology. We'll have leaf nodes, which are the variables or scalars that were created from scratch on the left-hand side. We'll have non-leaf nodes, which are each of the variables that were created along the way. And we'll additionally have to deal with constant terms, which are terms passed in that do not need variables. Our algorithm for a backchain will follow the following approach. We'll first call topological sort on the graph. We'll then create a dictionary of all the scalar variables, as well as their derivatives. This corresponds to each of the circles in the graph itself. We'll then run over each one of these nodes in backwards order, where each, each step, if the variable is a leaf, we simply add to its final derivative. And if the variable is not a leaf, we call backwards with its derivative as d. We loop through all the variables and derivatives that were created as input to the function that we just passed through. And then we accumulate all these derivatives for their variables. Here I'm using the term variable to represent scalar in the backpropagation graph itself. I use the term variable here because in the future we'll use other values besides scalars in our graph, and we want to implement this in the most general way possible. So let's go back to our example. So here, each one of our arrows represents a variable in the graph. We start with the final variable on the rightmost side. Its derivative is 1, the d value that gets passed to the backwards of the rightmost box. After going through this box, we get the derivatives with respect to both of the input arguments. We'll then take the first and call backwards on the node to its left. Here, we have an interesting decision. We now have the derivative all the way to the left, so we could call backwards on the first box. However, this variable was also used on the bottom path in this graph, so it would be better for us to wait in order to call that backwards. So instead of proceeding to the left, we go back and call backward on the lower node for the right-hand side. We then call backwards for the lower middle box 